Yeah, I'll, I'll just jump in. So uh, I'll start off by saying that, um, yeah, I, I was originally actually going to give a talk on Horus. I'm actually going to, which is a form verification tool for StockNet. Probably most of you guys don't know too much about what that is. I'm going to talk a bit more about that uh, at the beginning of the talk. I'm going to try and essentially rush through this talk, this half hour talk in about 15, 20 minutes. And then because some people in the audience, I gave this talk recently at ETH Denver, some people have already seen it. And I'm going to give a bit of a 10 minutes at the end of original content about uh, ZKVM, ZK circuits, and how to verify them. Uh, it will be a bit off the cuff, so be prepared for this to be a bit unstructured. And if I'm saying anything nonsensical that you don't understand, this isn't as structured as I li I'd like it to be. So feel free to interrupt me uh, and uh, and tell me, you know, I'm not making sense and I'll try and fill you in a little bit more. Okay, do I have a clicker? Okay, thank you, sorry. Cool, so as I said, I'll start off by uh, talking a little bit about StockNet. So the first question many of you guys probably have is, well, well what the hell is StockNet? Uh, it's an Ethereum L2 that in particular it uses, uh, it's a ZK rollup that uses stock. So those are these succinct, uh, no, not succinct, scalable, uh, what's the T for? I can't remember right now. Something arguments of knowledge. Sorry, I should remember this, but uh, transparent, that's it. Scalable, transparent argu uh, arguments of knowledge. So it's, a, it's some sort of ZK methodology. And essentially the idea is that StockNet runs a ZKVM on which you can run uh, arbitrary Turing complete computations in this Cairo bytecode, which we're going to talk a bit more about in a second. And it gives you a, a state update, which then you can provide. The ZKVM actually uh, provides a zero knowledge seal, which you can verify much, much faster than rerunning the original computation. And so you can actually verify that the state update that it gives is actually the state update of running this computation, right, without actually rerunning it. Um, okay, so as I said, we have this Cairo bytecode, and it, it's essentially the whole the high, whole Cairo zkVM on which this all runs uh, is designed to be the the, the bytecode it uses is designed to be zero knowledge expressed as a zero knowledge proof as easily as possible, and so that means that the bytecode is quite unusual. Uh, it it the the, the well you, you'll see a little bit more about it in a second. But it has uh, quite, like you'll see quite a strange and unusual structure relative to the computational model you're probably used to in your day-to-day -day life. Uh, and finally, this is a little bit of me shilling and never mind the company I work for. We've developed this warp compiler, which allows you guys to compile Solidity directly into Cairo. And so you can, if you already have some Solidity implementation of some protocol, you guys can just warp it directly onto StockNet, and you're good to go. You can ZK it. So all good. Uh, perfect. So, why why is this why is the computational model of Cairo is so weird? Well, the first thing is it is a non-deterministic stack machine. So that means that rather than following a single computational path, it can follow several computational paths simultaneously. Uh, and you're probably going to say, "Hey, that sounds tremendously computationally inefficient," and you'd be right. Uh, so <laughs> there are some ways that we have around that uh, to still to still get a reasonable degree of performance with that while having this non-determinism. And we'll talk about that more in a second. It also has a very very small instruction set, which makes the uh, uh, the semantics of this expa uh, like expressible as a DK circuit as easily as possible. So it only has. Do I have a laser on this thing somehow? Yeah, so it, it only has uh, assertions, calls, returns, and jumps. Uh, and oh, yeah, and increment, uh, incrementing of this allocation pointer that we'll talk a little bit more about. But it's essentially the pointer that, that points to the head of the, of the stack that we have. So it's, it's a very, very simple set of instructions. That means, as I said, we can express the semantics of this bytecode in, uh, in ZK circuits fairly easily. Uh, the other thing that it has is it has read only memory. So uh, essentially, you can think of, once again, as I said, this is non-deterministic. You can think of the machine as essentially it guesses in advance what the memory should, what the memory map should look like. It guesses it, and then we run the program, and we check constraints on this memory, and we see if they're satisfied. That's, that's how you should think of this computational model. The next thing is that the primitive values you're used to in most of your, um, in mo in most of your like, uh, what do you call it? Uh, smart contract languages. You might have like ints and un two five sixes as your primitive types. Here they are field elements from this field, which is trust me, this is a prime number. Uh, I mean, you can check if you want. You'll see it's it's true. Uh, and so, yeah, so it's it's some prime field, and this obviously makes it much more e easier to express this as a zk circuit. But it has a lot of semantics that you average. 
might not quite expect, right? It's not a prime power. So, well, it is a prime power. It's a prime to the power of one, specifically. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's a, not, not a non-trivial prime power, shall we say. Uh, and the second thing is, you guys might say, hey, this is a very small instruction set. Isn't this a Turing tarpit? So uh, a Turing tarpit is a language where everything is possible, like Turing complete, but nothing is easy, essentially. And the answer is, yes, you're right. It is a Turing tarpit, if it weren't for these, uh, these built-ins, essentially. So on top of all of these commands, um, we have essentially, uh, uh, like the, the Cairo virtual machine has these special segments of memory which are passed to you as addresses at runtime from the ZKVM itself. And it tells you essentially, if I write th various things to this area of memory, special things will happen, right? That you, that you could still compute with the, the normal instruction set, but it would be incredibly slow, right? And so uh, a few of these things are things like range checks, where there is a, um, a, an area of memory where I can write very like I can write um, some field element to this area of memory, and the the zkVM will assert essentially that this um, that the, this uh, part, this that this felt must be smaller than two to the one two eight, right? Which is something you could do with all of these instructions. But what you'd have to do is you would have to set some register to two to one two eight, set one another like area of memory to uh, the felt that you want to check if it's greater than 2 to the 128 and you want to continue decre continuously decrement them until one of them hits zero and depending on which one hits zero first you say okay well that one it's smaller than 2 to the 128 or greater than right and that's obviously tremendously computationally inefficient you really don't want to be doing that so so we have all of these things that allow us to uh, um to 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 express things uh, to to be able to express things in a slightly more computationally efficient way we also oh sorry go ahead good order yeah, yeah, sure. Go, go ahead, go ahead. But, um, when you when you generate the zk proof right yes. from an execution, yes, does this knowledge help you to generate a proof faster, a cryptographic proof faster, the, or you still have to take the semantics into account anyway when you generate the the proof? And it's all about executing things faster. Yeah. Faster. So so uh, I I think that the structure of the language is designed in such a way that the zero knowledge circuits are very very small. So you'll see that the, the zero knowledge circuits of the uh, Cairo VM are smaller than any other ZK VM I'm aware of by several orders of magnitude. I, I'd say about two orders of magnitude, less, less polynomial constraints than you would usually expect. So I, I would say that, and that obviously has a massive effect on the efficiency of proof generation and these sorts of things, right? And, uh, you know, I mean, everyone's working on this problem, but from what I've seen, Cairo is definitely in terms of the speed of proof generation, for a given program is, is definitely number one for the moment. For the moment. No, no, not at all. So there is so this all runs on a ZKVM, right? Which is there is a, a set, set of uh, circuits which are much like a CPU, right? I when I have a Cairo program, it's a, a bunch of bytecode, like a list of instructions. I write that to memory somewhere, and I start the ZKVM. Right? It then executes these instructions step by step. And what I have at the end is a seal. Right, The seal at the end certifies that the ZKVM was correctly executed according to the semantic rules associated with this bytecode. Right? Does that make sense? OK, OK. Um, how am I doing time-wise, by the way? Because I need to try and pay. Oh, god, terribly, terribly. <laughs> <laughs> That's not, I'm on slide number two, and I don't, oh God, anyway, I'm going to try my best. Sorry, guys. Uh, sorry? Okay, yeah, I did, I did start five minutes late. So, yeah, if you guys can give me an extra five minutes. Um, yeah, so, so I, I was going to give a couple of examples. I'll jump through them really quickly that uh, will uh, sort of motivate a few of these points to you. So this is a, a, a piece of code which essentially asks you, well, is one felt bigger than another, right? And uh, uh, essentially, the, uh, the way that we do this is a non, we have this jump here, which jumps on, well, we look at this address on the stack and we ask, is it zero or not, right? And the answer is actually, we've, we haven't assigned anything to AP. So this is a non-deterministic jump. It doesn't know which way it's gonna jump. And essentially, you have two branches here, right? Which one asserts that, uh, uh, that A is smaller than B, and the other one asserts that B is smaller than or equal to A, and they return one or zero depending on which branch you're in, right? 
And so essentially what ha you can think of this as, a, uh, as exploring both branches. In one of them, necessarily, there will be an assert that fails, and the other one will be the only one that succeeds and actually returns, if that makes sense. But as we said, this uh, is tremendously computationally inefficient, right? And so essentially, we have this thing I've just highlighted in red, and we call these hints. Essentially, they are small little pieces of Python code that you can in, in, in well, actually a subset of Python that you can inline into your Cairo programs and it essentially tells the uh, uh, non-deterministic state machine, hey, you probably want to explore this path rather than the other, right? And so this, this thing sort of does the obvious thing of it says, well, memory, the, the value of AP should be zero if A is smaller than or equal to B, otherwise it should be one. Right, and that tell, decide, tells you which direction you should go. Sorry, go ahead, Val. Of the what? Sorry. Uh, ooh. Uh, as I said, it, it is essentially just uh, a slightly constrained uh, Python, right? So I, 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 I guess you can go and have a. Y yes, except, okay, so to be completely clear, obviously you can do a lot of bad things in Python that you may not want to allow to be inlined into your smart contract, right? And so actually on, so uh, you can run Cairo locally on your machine locally and generate seals. And there you can run whatever Python you want as the hints, right? Literally any, any Python you might want. In, oh, um, in, uh, on StarkNet itself, right? When you're actually sending these uh, Cairo programs to other people and having them execute them, you probably don't want them to be allowed to execute arbitrary Python that I'm sending them. Uh, so actually there's a whitelisting system which says, hey, there's this finite set of about like 15 snippets of Python code which are allowed on StarkNet and nothing else is. And, and you can't like update them later? Uh, so they can, those snippets can be updated. So the client, the client can obviously be updated and and choose a different set of snippets which will be permitted. Um, but like if I, up, so this isn't like a smart contract on the blockchain or something. Is yeah, it, yeah, this, it this is. is a smart contract. Okay, but so I need to redeploy it to to the same address with new comments. Ah, so you're saying if hypothetically I've written some StockNet smart contract and then in the future the StockNet client changes a set of whitelisted Python hints. Uh, no, no, I just I, I just have do. a better hint that I came up with and I want to upgrade my hint. Ah, okay. So as I said, for the moment you have a set of 15 hints which you're, that's all that you're allowed. Oh, I thought right. you were talking about like 15 Python words or something. No, 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 no. no, no. Okay. It's 15 literal Python okay, snippets. Okay. That seems Nothing safe. else is allowed, okay. right? Uh, so it, it's literally those 15 or 16. I mean, you can have you can check this online. I don't know them all off the top of my head, but there are about 15 of them, and you're only allowed those snippets. In the future, uh, as I said, the set of snippets might be updated, but mostly it will be an append-only list because you don't want to invalidate previous smart contracts, right? So you yeah. should have competition for securities. <laughs> Potentially, I'll suggest that to them. Lot. <laughs> so, thank you. Um, Cool. Uh, okay, where was I with all of this? Okay, so I mentioned we've talked about non-determinism. We've talked about how this is uh, th this non-determinism is dealt with. Uh, the other thing that I mentioned is, hey, uh, you might have noticed there's this weird annotation here where I write this known AP change thing, and for some reason I'm incrementing my stack pointer in the middle here. Why might that be? Well, as we mentioned here, our memory map is completely uh, immutable. Right, and this creates some issues in terms of being able to know where to find references in the future. So, if I have a setup, a, bit, a little code snippet that looks like this, and I, I make a call to f, which it uses some unknown number of cells on the stack, right? So it it, um, it uses you know some some random natural number of cells on the stack, and then it returns the in in a normal uh, stack-based language where we would have uh, mutable memory, right? The, usually the contract between the caller and the callee of a function is that when the callee returns, it returns a stack pointer in the same position, perhaps with like one or two things pushed ahead of it, which will be the return values of the function, right? That's not possible here. I can't just jump back to some point in the stack in the past because all of these cells have now been written to and I, 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 can't, I can't just do that. I need to stay in the same place in the stack. That means, however, that if somewhere above this F in the program, or well, yeah, if, if somehow after this F, I've done some unknown number of steps, and then I write something to memory, and then I do another thing with an unknown number of steps, X has been written to the stack somewhere. If I want to refer to X after the second F, 
how do I find where X is written to memory? The answer is it's not possible to, know, to statically know it in general. And so in general, you often want in, uh, to prevent this problem, to prevent your variable, your local variables from being invalidated because we can't statically infer at compile time where to find them. We want to be able to have these known AP changes where I know how much the function will increment the stack pointer, right, statically at compile time. And so this is what this AP plus six is for, right? It essentially makes sure that because um, uh, it, it essentially makes sure that which uh, this LE and L LT felt uh, instructions use different amounts of cells on the on the stack, and so this AP plus equals six basically makes sure that they both use the same amount, and like that you have a total. In fact, this this uh, function uses twenty uh, cells, and so I know that uh, when I call this is LE felt function, I know that afterwards my AP is being incremented by twenty, and so if I want to know where X is, say right on my stack, well I can look at where it was before, plus 20, and I know where to find it. I've got 10 minutes left, essentially, and I'm like a quarter of the way through the talk. I have no idea how this is going to work. <laughs> so, anyways, um, cool. Uh, OK, some other weird thing. OK, I'm just going to probably just uh, skip over this really quickly. I mentioned the built-ins. Uh, one weird thing about built-ins is essentially we have these a range check pointer, which is this area of memory where if I write things to it, it will assert that this is smaller than 2 to the 128. If A here is greater than 2 to the 128, essentially the program fails. One weird thing about the semantics here is actually if I don't update this range check pointer before, so I don't increment it before I return it to the, out, the outside context, actually the semantics don't require this range check to have been checked. And so essentially the semantics of this instruction here depends on what happens after it which is kind of unusual uh, and, and not the best. I, I, I'm sure that Vlad is having all sorts of ideas about time travel <laughs> and these sorts of things. But yeah, anyways, and then the final thing is, uh, long story short, this is probably not so unusual for people who write smart contracts, that you have uh, on top of our immutable memory, there's this thing called storage memory, which actually is mutable. And this is where your storage variables are stored, right? Long story short. OK, cool. So. Uh, um, yeah, OK, so as I said, I'm talking about Horus here. That's maybe gotten a bit lost <laughs> with all of the questions, which is a formal verification tool for all of, the, uh, for all of these StockNet smart contracts that we've been talking about. So uh, um, in fact, actually, it, it allows you to write specifications for, um, for StockNet functions in a whole logic style, right? So writing preconditions and postconditions I think, yeah, I give an example here. So essentially what this, this uh, example here shows, we have a precondition, and this is a Horus annotation was come up in red above, right? So it's a normal, th these would, to the StarkNet compiler, these would come out as normal uh, comments, but obviously with our Horus verification tool, it interprets them as, uh, to, as specifications that we actually want to prove. And what this says is given the precondition that we know that the input, so this is a function, sorry, just very quickly, this is a function that takes some token, which should be zero or one, and returns the opposite token. And this is for like some trading pair or something like that, right? And um, essentially what this says is we have a precondition. So we assume at the beginning of the function that the token is zero or one. And afterwards we say that if the token was zero, then we return one. Otherwise, if the token was one, we return zero. Right, and, and we can annotate our functions with these sorts of uh, specifications really rather straightforwardly. And um, essentially, Horus, I'll go really quickly through this to try and save. Essentially, Horus has a bunch of stages. What it does is it, can, it compiles this into bytecode. It then takes this bytecode and the specifications. It converts them into what are known as SMT queries which uh, if you guys know what SAT solvers are, I'm hoping there are a bunch of like logicians and these sorts of things in the room. So hopefully a lot of you will know what SAT solvers are and SMT solvers are. But essentially it is a mathematical query which contains a bunch of, assert of like arithmetic assertions in them. And the, the, the SMT solver tries to check whether it's satisfiable. And if it does, it tries to give you like an assignment of the atoms in these uh, these uh, what do you call it these assertions such that uh, such that all of all of the assertions we have hold or it tries to prove that these are unsatisfiable right and essentially we generate we convert the semantics of these programs with their pre and post conditions into uh, uh, and and split them up in various sort of smart ways like actually. Uh, Grigore talked about yesterday splitting these things up into subproofs, compositionality, all of these sorts of things. I'm not going to talk too much about how we do that because of how little time I have. Uh, but essentially, it discharges them to SMT solvers, and these SMT solvers can check whether there are paths 
uh, if there's a satisfiable case where we go from the precondition through the semantics of our program to a state where the post doesn't hold, we have a violation. Otherwise, if that's unsatisfiable, we know that actually it must be the case that the semantics are that the semantics hold. Okay, cool. Uh, how long do I have? Left? Sorry, Greg. <laughs> okay, okay, sure. So, um, do you take into account at all or this zk? stuff or you simply have a semantic programming language independent of zk yeah so so the, the whole idea here is that the zk vm gives us an abstraction where we have essentially just uh, a normal in quotes normal because we've seen how weird the language is programming language that we can just think about its semantics and reason about those and for example and here we the horus tool only reasons at the level of these high level language semantics it does not care about the underlying zk circuits what i'm going to try and do Grigore, is fit in after i stop rambling about this five minutes about how we actually also worked on verifying the zk circuits against the language semantics i have no idea how i'm going to do that in five minutes or even you know make sense at all but you know i'm going to try i'm going to try uh, okay, so this was a circuit diagram that, that that is written in ticks and looks like it was made by a five-year-old. Yes, my ticks is not very good. Uh, don't worry too much about it. Uh, yeah, this doesn't matter. Uh, okay, so, so I, I mean, I, I'm just I'm just trying to get get. I'm just trying. Th this was all about how this modularity, right, Gilgarda, that we were talking about, that we essentially we take. I, I will go over it very very quickly. Uh, we take we generate we take our our Cairo programs. We generate some CFGs, right. Uh, we uh, have some standard specs, so are some basic like library functions where we just inject specs automatically for the, for you. We do some inlining where when there are function calls which haven't been specified because we don't want the users to have to write specs for every single function, and that that would be quite time consuming. So we do a lot of inlining where functions don't have recursion or and have relatively simple control flow where we just chuck the semantics into the callee, uh, the caller, sorry, and we have these optimizing edges where we essentially break down if we have a function call where we want to check the pre and these sorts of things we break it down into sub, sub problems where we take the program from the beginning of your function call from the beginning of your function all the way to the first function call check the pre there and these sorts of things so we break it down into lots of different sub uh, sub problems right we then split it up into modules where we have these basic blocks like we got talked about we split it up into programs which are just straight line programs with no um, with absolutely no control flow in them. They just have a pre and post condition. And then essentially, with all sorts of crazy optimizations, you don't need to worry too much about this. I had a much longer talk to give about this, but I won't today. Uh, we just we convert this into SMT queries and we check them, right? Cool, okay. So we're gonna do a bunch of things with uh, Horus in the future. Let's not worry too much about those. Uh, there are a few things that need to be done to essentially be able to make it practically usable. Okay, now I'm going to pass, in to, uh, pass on to the part of my talk where I attempt to talk a little bit about how actually this ZKVM is constructed. And this is going to be on the whiteboard. I don't, is there a way, I don't know how I'm going to hold this microphone while I, while I write, but yeah, I don't know. Can, can, the, can the people on the video please still hear me? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, I think, I think that, yeah, that actually will work. I don't know if people on the video are yeah. like, can they hear me? Okay, 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 cool. Okay, so now that I've gotten very quickly through that horse talk, how long do I have left? Minus two minutes? No, you have officially five more minutes. Officially five yeah, more minutes. Five more. Okay, 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 fine. Um, cool, so uh, all of this is very nice, but as Grigore pointed out, with, uh, I think that the problem is that the camera is over, is faced over here, and so if we want this to be visible on the video call, it needs to be at this sort of angle. I don't know if everyone in the room can see. Uh, maybe maybe we can find some compromise, something like this, if yeah, that works. Sorry? Okay, cool, cool. Um, okay, so as Grigorda pointed out, we have this, uh, Cairo is a ZKVM, right? Which just gives you, there's some programming language called Cairo that we write all of our programs and then it just executes this. And this is like a normal uh, programming language, except at the end, I like, can get the proof of computational integrity, right? But there's a question. Like, like, Cairo and Cairo VM. Yes, Cairo and Cairo. Cairo, and Cairo. Cairo is a high level programming language. Cairo VM is how all of this is implemented into uh, some ZK methodology. And I'm gonna talk about that very quickly, right? So uh, as I mentioned earlier, we uh, uh, Cairo is implemented with these things called stocks, right? So these succinct, succinct, uh, scalable transparent argument, arguments of knowledge. Sorry, I always get confused with stocks, with snocks too. 
Uh, and what is a uh, stock? How does it work? And how is it that I can encode a computation into it? Well, actually, how it works is this. Uh, you can think of your program as being this long matrix, right, which has some number of uh, rows in it and some number of columns, right? Each column, essentially, you can think of as representing one time step in the computation, right? So this is like a clock tick in your CPU, right? In all of the rows, we have various parts of the state of the machine, right? So we're talking about the, the, this being a stack machine with a mutable memory. So actually, the state of the Cairo VM can be thought of as M, which is a map from our field, which I'll just write F, right, to another field, right? So that's one thing. It also then has a trace, which is a list of triples of an AP. So an AP is the pointer into the memory of the head of our stack, right? We have an FP, which is our frame pointer that keeps track of where the stack in, in the current function calls start, right? And people who are familiar with stack machines will, will know all of these things, right? And then you have a PC, which is your program counter, which, part, which points to the next instruction, right? And essentially all this will do is uh, um, it, essentially all this will do is where the, at each at each step we check the PC we look at, in the memory where that PC is we get a felt we in, interpret that instruction as some entire instruction and we on the basis of this apply various constraints to the memory right and as we said we sort of non deterministically guess what the memory is in advance. That's not actually really what happens, but you can think of a computational model like this, and we just make these assertions on it. So these uh, rows, essentially, well, one of them you can imagine is going to be the FP, one of them is going to be the, the sorry, AP, one of them will be the FP, one of them will be the PC, and of course, there are all sorts of other intermediate values that come in here, right? So, so we have this big, this uh, huge uh, matrix, right? Uh, which, as I said, we have one, like one row, uh, row for each time set of the computation, one column for various pieces of the state. And how do we ZK all of this? This is for one program, one program. Uh, no, this, this describes the semantics of the whole ZKPI, right? As I said, uh, we have this AP, FP, and PC, and at each point in time. So when the, if we, I want to execute a given program on the Cairo, uh, the Cairo VM, right? I will, at the beginning, I will set up the M, I will choose M such that I know that at, at the PC, the initial PC I choose, the program that I want to execute has been written, right? And so the first thing we'll do is they will look at the first PC, it will look there in memory, it will interpret the first instruction, apply the constraints, and then continue executing. Yeah, so somewhere, somewhere in this column, in fact, actually the representation of the memory, because you know, this field is huge, right? Is actually it's not quite as straightforward as you might think. It's not like there's one memory cell per um, per, per per element of this memory map. Otherwise, we would have a truly computationally untractable. Uh, I mean, it's already pretty big, but completely computationally untractable. Thing. And in fact, there are the a bunch of like uh, memory digest systems which are used to represent enough information about the memory to make sure that the constraints are applied. But I'm not. I'm definitely not going to go into the details of that in the three minutes I have left. Oh well, very much. <laughs> is the uh, is it forward? Yes, it is too. It is too. So there are two maps. So this is an immutable map, and there's also I was trying to keep it simple here, for that, but yes, there's also a storage map encoded in all of this. And that, no, 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 no. There's a separate map which we're going to call S, and that one is actually mutable and can be changed over time, right? As I said. Explaining that is an even bigger nightmare. So I was trying to include that, but thank you. Matt. You could Yeah, yeah. I mean, that would only require two times two to the five, two to two, two to the two five one uh, set tra uh, trace cells, right? So yeah, of course we can do that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, if you don't change them, you get, so yeah, that is sort of how the memory map works without going into too many details. Essentially, we don't encode the whole memory map. We just encode some basic constraints about some of the cells 
and then do various like comparisons between like okay there's an access here if it's equal to this well it must be equal to this and the the return and value must be equal to one of these these constraint values i put in, the, in as part of the input like this must be like part of the program these sorts of things right and that's how we kind of occlude modeling of the memory fully uh, as I said, I don't want to talk too much about that because then I'll be talking for another hour or so. So that's okay. Um, sorry? Okay. <laughs> that would have been too easy. But, uh, okay, fine, fine, fine. Um, cool. Okay. So how do I um, pr convert this huge, tra this huge computational trace into something that can be used to be able to do that I've actually uh done this computation appropriately like at each point i've done the right lookup i found the right cell in memory gotten the right instruction executed the semantics correctly well the answer to this question is actually we have these things called airs which are algebraic intermediate representations right and there's they're things of the form for all i where i is some instruction index some bunch of constraints hold right so it might say something like okay um I, I look up, I know that uh, at uh, PCI, right, so at, at this row, at instruction I, I know that uh, I have, I, I'm going to abuse, abuse the nation really heavily. But I, essentially, I can write a, actually, no, let me just write a simple example. You can say something like this, right? Something like this. W what would this be for? Well, this is me computing the fifth Archie sequence in this number, right? So I, I'd say that I have some element A in my trace, uh, which I start, I start off with some initial value, and the, the sum of two uh, adjacent values must equal the next value in the trace, right? And so if I had a trace with a simple trace with a single entry here, which is just A, right, then I start off with zero and one in the first two entries, right? Well, the, because of this constraint, I need to have one here and then two here, blah, 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 right? And I might have some other constraints like, a of zero equals zero and a of one, no, no, a of one equals one, right? And all of these constraints together, these polynomial constraints together, these multivariable polynomial constraints together enforce the semantics of what I have, right? So here we encode essentially the semantics of the of the ZKVM into a bunch of S, these polynomial constraints. And then essentially what, what we do, so we have polynomial constraints that relate all of the rows and columns, right? And you can think of each one of these uh, rows as a, uh, a single function with values that change over time, right? And so essentially what, how, the, how, how sparks work here is once we've ran this computation, we have filled in all of the values here of the, as the computation evolves. What we do is we take each one of these rows one at a time. We interpolate the po polynomial over this finite field that actually holds all of these values at the appropriate time. And then we use uh, something known as a fry to prove to some third party in our ZK methodology to prove to the verifier that I know polynomials that satisfy all of the constraints that impose. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh. Do you want the microphone? So in the case of Fibonacci, yes. right, if you just look at the sequence, you have to somehow learn the polynomial that this is Fibonacci. Yeah, yeah. So how do you that do that for an arbitrary program? Is like from an arbitrary execution now you can infer. Yeah, yeah. So so the as here in the case of uh, of Cairo encode the semantics of of our VM. Right. right, right. So you have the semantics of programming language, but even if I go back to your uh, Fibonacci sequence, yeah, yeah. right? I know the semantics of natural numbers, yeah. but still, I just if I just look at this sequence, yeah. I have to be smart to figure out the rule that you know. You sure, add two sure. into so, the next so, one. So in this case, so, it, so the semantics of programming language is not enough here, right? In order to get the nice polynomials, of a succinct. Uh, okay, now we're talking about different different things here now for, for a second. So um, yeah, so it is the, the case that essentially this is. Uh, oh, sorry, I don't know if people can hear me online. But yeah, there, one second. So uh, okay, we, we've gotten two different questions here. Um, the, uh, let me get this right. Um, so it is the case that essentially this doesn't exploit 
the semantics of the, the actual program it's running, right? Those are in no way, uh, um, in no way represented in the ads, right? This was just an example to try and motivate, like, this is how I might include specifically a Fibonacci program yeah. into ads. But in general, what happens with Cairo is the ads, as I said, uh, represent a program which, you know, run the semantics of, of the Cairo VM. Does that make sense? Yeah. It is a finite execution. Right. Right. Sure. Uh, sure, that, and and we could also get into how we can do recursive stocks, but not in the time I okay. I've, I've been given five a hard five minutes now, so I'll try and finish. I'll try and wrap this up in some way and get to some sort of conclusion in the next five minutes. Every so no 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 it, it's it's that every so it it, it is true because of the. Um, uh, what do you put it? The the fundamental theorem of algebra, right? That yeah. if I have like the length of this uh this this computational trace is n, right? I can find a polynomial of degree n minus one inside of that finite field that can have those polynomials, right? That's the fundamental theorem of algebra. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So you can compute it using like Hamilton interpolation. Yes. But the fact that the polynomial exists is a is a is a uh, consequence of the fundamental. Anyway, I mean this is <laughs> this is irrelevant right now. But uh, yeah. Uh, oh, actually, whose microphone is this? Uh, okay, I'll, I'll just leave this here. I'll just leave this here. Um, okay. Cool. Um, I even forgot what I was going to say. Ah, yes, I was talking about. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> what is FRI? Uh, ah, yes, I'm about so uh, FRI is the method. So once I know these polynomials, right, I I I, I have generated my computational trace. I've interpolated the polynomials for each row of this computational trace, right, and I have a bunch of polynomial constraints that I want to prove to a third party that I know, right. I know I, that I know polynomials that satisfy those constraints, right, and that's how I do the the whole DK. And this is all done with what are known as FRIES. It's a very, very simple acronym. It stands for the Fast Reed Solomon Interactive Oracle Proof of Polynomial Proximity. Right. So, <laughs> so what, what it essentially does, this Fast Reed Solomon Interactive Proof of Oracle, uh, this Interactive Oracle Proof of Polynomial Proximity allows me to prove to a third party that I know a polynomial that satisfies a bunch of constraints without actually having to give them the whole polynomial and explain to them what it is, right? Uh, so, so th this fry is what underlies uh, this whole methodology and allows me to prove to a third party that I actually know polynomials, that all of this computation uh, satisfies various constraints that me that, imp that encode the semantics of the, uh, of the ZKPM. Okay, so my plan in this talk originally was to then actually show you guys how one might talk a little bit about the instruction format for Cairo and uh, actually talk about how we would write a decoder using ZK circuits, right? How we'd write a bunch of constraints that would sort of encode uh, a, a decoder for these instructions and set a bunch of flags that would uh, that would essentially then allow you to have some ALU, some arithmetic logic sequence that looks at these flags and then encodes the, the constraints over the memory that we want given this. However, I think I have about two minutes left. Okay, I have one minute left, <laughs> so, so I'm definitely not going to be doing that today. Uh, but uh, essentially, the I guess the takeaway from all of this is uh, we have a cool tool for formally verifying all of this Cairo stuff. Have a look at Horus, search it online, uh, talk to me about it if you want to. And essentially, there are these stock methodologies which allow you to do uh, zero knowledge proofs of like ar essentially arbitrary Turing compute uh, computations that arbitrary during complete computations have been carried out as proofs of computational integrity. And, you know, I think they open up a whole new world of scalability in the blockchain space. So, and I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you very much.